The at will employment doctrine, which allows employers in most states to discharge workers for any reason, and the sub minimum wage for tip workers are both rooted in the employer backlash to the emancipation. These laws continue to disadvantage workers, black and Latino, workers in particular. Even after the Reconstruction era, the labor hierarchy that expected servitude from black workers remained intact and compensation for their labor was left to customer discretion. I'll be back. Hello, welcome back everyone. Thank you for returning. Those who are new to this channel, thank you. We appreciate you as well. Let's get on with this. Now, before I get into this article, I wanted to make a clarification. This video is really for everyone. It doesn't matter your race or ethnicity because at the end of the day, if you are working a nine to five, no matter what, I don't, I don't care if it's white collar job, you're getting the check from someone else. You're not independent. In other words, this video applies to you because you're being treated. I don't care if you're getting, I don't care how, how much money you're getting paid. You are still being treated as a slave. Let's get on with this. I found a, an article that goes more into details about how our jobs are literally extensions of slavery matter of fact the um a lot of employers consulted with actual enslavers and got tips from them on how to run their business no lie you're gonna see how your job is basically even though you're being paid mimic how enslavers ran their plantations crazy so let's get on with this the at will doctrine stems from the period after the civil war when employers largely in the railroad industry sought to limit the growing power of organized workers including formerly enslaved black workers by reserving the right to fire them for any reason Proponents argue that if workers now have the right to quit without restrictions, employers should have the right to fire without reason or explanation. Though never turned into legislation, this practice became entrenched in U.S. law through judicial decisions over the course of several decades. Today, most employers can legally fire anyone without warning or explanation, a power imbalance that forces many workers to accept exploitative working conditions out of fear of losing their jobs. Under the at-will doctrine, it is exceedingly difficult for workers to prove when they have been illegally fired for discriminatory or retaliatory reasons or for government agencies to enforce laws protecting workers against discrimination or retaliation. These circumstances disproportionately affect black and Hispanic workers who are more likely than white workers to have low paying jobs and to express concern about retaliation for speaking out about unsafe or unfair working conditions. As a step toward addressing this power imbalance, state, local, and federal legislators must enact just cause that protect workers against sudden and unjust firings. Just cause job protections would require employers to provide and prove a justifiable reason for discharging a worker and give fair notice. In turn, workers could more safely insist on better working conditions with less risk of losing their livelihoods. What I want to say about the 
uh, at will doctrine. I remember there was a time that employers couldn't just fire you for any reason. They had to have a substantial reason to fire you. It had to be documented and they, it had to be proof. Insubordination, absent too many times, they had to have a good reason to fire you. And I remember when they changed that. And they made it where they didn't have to have a good reason fire, to fire you. I was like, why would they do that? And now when I discovered this this article, I was like, oh, I see why. I knew something was up when they changed the law and made it where employers can fire you for any reason. I was like, what? Because I know, I, I know I'm not tripping. I knew there was a time that employers couldn't just fire you for any reason. I remember that. Let's go on. Just cause job protections require employers to provide and prove a justifiable reason for discharging a worker and to give fair notice. Tipping in lieu of wages is another practice that became widespread following emancipation. Those who waitress and do jobs and you get the bulk of your income from tipping. uh, Check this out. When hospitality sector employers hired many formerly enslaved workers, even after the Reconstruction era, the labor hierarchy that expected servitude from black workers remained intact and compensation for their labor was left to the customer discretion. Despite the organizing efforts of tipped workers, Most service industries were excluded from the first federal minimum wage law in 1938. While employers are now required to pay tip workers at least a sub-minimum wage, it has been frozen at a paltry $2.13 per hour at the federal level for more than 30 years. State law protections are a little better in the 43 states with a sub-minimum wage. As a result, these workers' livelihoods are still dependent on the goodwill of patrons. These laws technically require employers to cover differences between total tips and a minimum wage, but that requirement is hard to enforce and and often ignored. As a result, tip workers still earn fluctuating wages for their labor and may have to endure harassment from the customers they rely on. Black tip workers and black women in particular are at an even greater disadvantage because they earn less in tips than their white counterparts on average, with black women making nearly $5 less per hour than white men. The raise the wage the raise the wage act of 2021 currently stalled in Congress will phase out this unfair sub minimum wage for tip workers and raise the federal minimum wage from 725 to 15 per hour by 2025. According to the Economic Policy Institute, this shift would help eliminate poverty wages and raise the earnings of nearly a quarter of the U.S. workforce, about 32 million workers nearly one in three black workers one in four hispanic workers and one in five white workers would benefit from a a raised minimum wage black and hispanic women in particular are over represented among workers who stand to benefit according to the one fair wage campaign which advocates for eliminating the sub minimum wage paying tip workers the minimum wage with tips on top could reduce the race gender wage gap in the restaurant industry by 35 percent members of congress must act now to pass the bill to make a living wage mandatory across the country the raise the wage act will phase out the sub minimum wage for tip workers and raise the federal minimum wage this juneteenth we are in solidarity with workers taken to the street as part of the mass poor people's and low wage workers assembly and moral march on washington and to the polls to demand the right to an adequate standard of living and to work with dignity protecting workers from at will firings eliminating the sub minimum wage and raising wages overall are some of the minimum requirements 
for an equitable society, one in which all jobs pay a living wage and all workers can advocate for their rights without fear, retaliation or discrimination. Reversing unjust labor laws rooted in slavery is one step toward this vision and is long overdue. As I said in the beginning of this video, this is not just directed towards black folks because you got to think about it. Everybody, and I think I stressed that in the first video, I wasn't just talking to black folks, although I had a section speaking directly to them, I was speaking the videos for everybody. They're treating you all the same. I don't care if they pay white people more and black and Hispanics less. You, at the end of the day, you're still being treated as a slave. Because you know white folks, black folks, and Hispanic people are being discriminated against when it comes to fair wages and being promoted and having the, uh, the ability to advance. You guys have been there and heard them speaking boldly amongst each other about what they're not going to do and what they're going to do to black black folks. These corporations need your hands and your minds and your skills and your talents to keep going. You guys give it to them. You guys are so scared of losing your jobs that you, you, you let them treat you like slaves. Let's continue. So now we're going to get into the job market, how they came directly from slavery. Let's go. Labor Day was designed to honor the American labor movement, which push for better labor laws and outcomes for American workers. It started as a state holiday in Oregon in 1887 and became federally recognized on June 28, 1894. As some history books will teach you, the ancestors weren't exactly a part of this movement per se. Since the civil rights movement that gave way for some equality laws take shape didn't happen until eight decades later turns out that some of the harsh labor conditions american workers endure were likely a direct result of slavery unfortunately correlations between the workforce and american slavery remain today as millions of americans prepare to enjoy a much needed day off Blavity sat down with historian Jason Perkins, Ph.D., to explore the similarities between America's modern day workforce and its racist past. American slavery was rooted in capitalism as our current industry trend. Making these connections also allows us to continually understand contemporary systems, whether it be economic, social, or cultural systems and structures that continue to impact and devalue black life, Perkins told Blavity. The goal of most businesses is to make money by spending the least amount of money. So while the workforce may not have enslaved people or endangered servant in the modern era, the principles of early American capitalism remain present, Perkins said. The systems of employee operations may have been inspired by slavery. To understand how some employee operations came into play, Perkins points to communication between Southern plantation owners and Northern factory leaders. Did you guys hear that? They communicated with each other. Southern plantation owners and Northern factory leaders. Let's continue. If we're looking at slavery in the South, and remember, there's documentations and these things can be verified that a lot of enslavers kept journals, very detailed journals. They wrote down everything. Man, I wish I could get my hands on one of those. Let's go on. If we're looking at slavery in the South versus manufacturing and industrialists in the North, you have two similar yet different types of systems of control. What you did have pretty frequently is Southern enslavers and Northern industrial manufacturers in frequent conversations. So there's a lot of cross pollination taking place between the two, Perkins said. Things like record books, ledgers, and things of that nature have a heavy slavery influence. 
And I know in some of my videos, I, uh, I can't even remember. Which, of course, I can't remember which ones I said. Maybe the the the, the video I did on discussing how black men were being um, sexually abused too during slavery. I was talking about how a lot of things in this country and world are imitated from slavery. I know some people probably heard that. I was like, oh my God, black people are just gonna, you know, connect slavery to everything. Oh yes, yes. Because, and it, like I said, it ended on paper, but they, but they transitioned a lot of things that we do today came from slavery. And whether you're white, Hispanic, Asian, you're still being treated as a slave in a lot of facets in this society. Let's continue. You're being treated as a slave whether you want to or not and whether you're white or not and whether you're Asian or Hispanic or not. You, you guys want to, you know, when you really want to try to cut us, you want to come and say things about slavery and calling us negresses and all that. Okay, but today, modern time, regardless of your color, a lot of these um, corporations see you as a slave too. So <laughs> you want to laugh and make jokes to think about how you're being treated as a slave too. Let's go on. Southern enslavers kept diligent, extensive, exhaustive records, Perkins said. And in fact, if you compare many of those plantations to a lot of the factories and manufacturing centers outside of the South, that record keeping what would become known as scientific management in the 1880s and the late 19th century was much more advanced, comparatively speaking, in the South than it was in the North. Perkins said things like rewards and punishments similar to today's raises and performance improvement plans were also developed during this time. Both groups of people shared different notes in terms of, okay, how do I set up these contingencies? How do I observe what's going on, gather data, put in a particular structure or process, maybe establish or implement certain contingencies, rewards, punishments, and the like so I can maximize labor and maximize profit. Both groups shared play notes from each other. Mm. In other words, these folks didn't don't didn't come up with any brand new ideas on how to run new America after slavery. All they did was just transfer everything they did behind scenes and the documentation purposes, everything, the structure, the infrastructure of slavery, they transferred it to the modern America. That's all they did. Let's go on depreciation and appreciation of assets are yet other remnants of american slavery you guys hear that listen to this there are all these different kinds of similarities from even the way we think about something like appreciation and depreciation when i first read this part i thought about cars how you know you get them and then after you drive them off the lot they immediately depreciate that's how they did slavery slaves they transferred that to modern work labor, the workforce. Let's continue. There was this elaborate system of performated, standardized ledgers so you can list everything that you needed as a cotton planter or sugar enslaver. Perkins says these plantation owners would list every single variable of an enslaved person, their age, height, weight, skills, talents, history of illness, temperaments, physical scars, reproductive abilities, and more. This is how an enslaved person value would be appreciated. Or conversely, if you had a history of resistance, flight, if you had a particular illness, tuberculosis, or whatever the case may be, that could lead to you being ascribed depreciating value. And it really kind of gets at one of the cores of the institution of slavery, just in terms of this idea of commodifying black bodies. 
while this type of value system which included high levels of physical violence seems more extreme than what we see in today's workforce similar contingencies unfortunately still affect american laborers sometimes the threat of violence is as effective if not even more effective than the actual use of violence perkins says pointing to today's mental tactics used by modern day capitalists such as threats of termination or demerit systems while perkins noted that it's difficult to trace the origin points of modern management practices he said that plantation owners practice a similar style of management training that is seen today it's kind of complex but if we're talking about more modern management tactics modern contemporary business practices we can trace back to plantation and note that these particular business practices these managerial techniques you can trace them back to slavery he said and they're eerily similar to what we see today he pointed to Kathleen Rothenstahl's book, Accounting for Slavery, Masters, and Management, in which she detailed how plantations held complex structures of hierarchy in terms of management. She notes the similarity between the hierarchy of those plantations and the complex hierarchies that you would see today in multi-divisional U.S. companies. Perkins said the way managers are trained can be traced back to slavery. You can trace this back to plantations where the idea of sending people to different places to learn business practices, more specifically to learn managerial techniques, he said, so you would have these absentee land, these absentee plantation owners in England who would send their sons to the Caribbean to learn how to run a plantation to learn how to manage a plantation. Labor Day came after two major events in the labor movement, one a celebration and the other a fiery tragedy, all while primary workers were going on strike and demanding protection. Black laborers were often faced with the unfortunate choice of becoming strike breakers in an effort to earn money at a time when wages remain incredibly low for black Americans. In a sense, Perkins said, black laborers did not benefit much from the labor movement, but they were still a huge part of the history of how things all came together. I think Labor Day is an opportunity to commemorate that long history but also learn from that history and take lessons from the past and be able to apply it to what we are facing today in terms of worker rights workers protections and just kind of general labor struggles perkins said look at what's transpiring now and you see people of different races but particularly working class folk black brown and others really ratcheting up their activities around labor around working conditions better pay and all these different things perkins likened black people's celebration of labor day to juneteenth i think labor day in this respect similar to juneteenth where the purpose of the holiday is kind of some of the earliest iterations of it black americans got together and they were able to learn of the past particularly the history of slavery and then take those stories and use them as a lesson but also as an inspiration for the future he said i think black americans can do the same thing with labor day now my conclusion is this albeit black people i feel are, are being done the worst you can agree or disagree but let's move on speaking of speaking to black americans for lack of a better word we need to come together we need to heal we need to rebond because they have been attacking us so badly when it comes to us unifying they always found a way to bring division among us and it's still there today unfortunately but we need to unify and come together as one and move as one mighty group which i know we can do black people we've been so conditioned to stand on our own and fight for our own and really if you look at if you look through history when we came together regular citizens came together 
to, to to fight and make demands that happen we we really don't have too many people to rely on in this country and around this world i'm talking about even these so-called advocates and and um community leaders and what have you it's like yeah whatever i wish i would rely on you you can't rely on them because a lot of these people are bought and paid for and they they'll pretend like they are helping you but all they're doing is just wasting your time and holding you up having you thinking that they're rocking with you and, and they're paid to to um oppress you and keep you stagnant but the only issue we had was rich it was rich against the poor that was the issue we had before slavery that was the issue that all groups had before slavery it was the rich and it was the poor and of course the, the rich was oppressing the poor but then when slavery came it just all kind of different divisions and you know things came along with that so i so funny funny not funny ha ha like comedy it's funny when people come in and say on my my videos and come in to all my videos and short said oh my god you're just keeping the division i'm like god <sighs> you just let me know that you're a parrot and you just listen to everything you're being told and you don't take the time out your life to go read a book and today you don't even have an excuse if you don't know how to read and i'm not being funny because there are a lot of illiterate people in this nation if you don't know how to read they have audiobooks and then they have youtube so you don't even have to know how to look to read to 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 study you don't have to you can go find these books that'll teach you the truth. You can go find them on on, on audio. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you again for your time and attention and liking, coming, and sharing and subscribing. Appreciate your help. Have a good day, and I will see you in the next video.